felt a good hunk of his army in Harper's Ferry marching as fast as they could that day of the battle. And basically, it's a race and they're marching. Can I tell you it all about the plans? See, this is one of the battles, a few things different, we have a totally different course of history. And so Antietam was a big deal. Here's Antietam Creek winding its way. Here's the Potomac. These back is to the Potomac. He can't retreat. And so this really could end the war right here. And so McClellan's plan, big attack here, and then when Lee has to shift forces to stop this, they attack in the center, and then here. It's a pretty good attack if it all happens together. But what happened was McClellan sat up there on this hill and never actually got involved in the battle once it started. So you're going to have, instead of one big battle, three separate parts. And the first one, they're going to attack through a cornfield. Mature corn, ready to pick. How tall is mature corn? Boy, them. And so, this is actually a skill from reenactors going through corn, and it's a little bit lower. Because they filmed this in August so they could still see them. But it's going to be called the cornfield. And it's kind of hard to see. I took a still from this YouTube video. It's actually not a very good video. But it has them marching through the corn. And I'm just trying to imagine that. Now imagine the corn about a foot tall and trying to march through that. And thousands of men are going through the corn, through Miller's cornfield, towards the Confederate lines. And the Confederate lines are right near... A church of Pascus, a Dunker church, right there. I'm not getting like this. And they attacked through the cornfield, and when they got close to the Confederate line, they opened up with canister, remember canister, and bullets, and just mowed them down. But they kept coming, and they advanced, in fact, almost broke through. And also almost broke through this much more heavily forested area over here. They almost broke through, but then Lee sent reinforcements, pushed them back. General Hooker, the Union commander here ordered more men, kind of raged back and forth. He was wounded, his best general, General Meade, was wounded. Bodies were just piled up in the corn. Pretty soon, every stop of corn was cut down by bullets, from shell, from shot, all cut down. And reinforcements kept going back and forth all over this cornfield. Lee had to pull men over this way. But all began to break down then. So the next attack was going to come right here. Pretty good spot for the attack. There's a corps by, under the command of a general by the name of Mansfield. It's 63 years old. You need a pass. Yes. I'll do the staple. Where are you going? You took my notebook. Yeah, I need a notebook. <laughs> Mansfield was in his 60s. He was, you get a little pass. You put up the flashboard or something, okay? I'm going to use your pencil. And just say so you're fill out the essay and, and if, what teach who's your what what class? Huh? Yeah. All right. If, if they get mad, remember it's Mr. Larson, right? Okay. <laughs> so with that, Mansfield never let his men in combat have, I guess he had like white hair down below his shoulders. And he was leading his men at the front. You're trying to prove he could really fight you know, so at that level. What's gonna happen? He is mortally wounded right now. He goes down right about here, and his men break up. About a third start marching this way. Can you imagine marching this way in front of the Confederate line? And they were just mowed down. The other ones got lost in the woods. And by the time the smoke cleared, there are well over 10,000 bodies in the cornfield. It almost worked, but they didn't coordinate the attacks. And while this quit, it picked up over here. And over here, the next commander was supposed to go here. Instead, he attacked here. And it was a sunken road that eroded down. The sunken road, think about a road that's been used over and over again. Rain went through and soon eroded down to basically a six-foot trench. There you go. And you know, we have a quiz tomorrow. And yeah. Okay, good. But I didn't tell you this, I almost forgot. Matthew Brady had a photography studio in Philadelphia. And day a day after the battle, when he heard about it, he had all his camera make it in the wagon and ride as quickly as they could to Antietam. Not that far away. And when they got there, 
there were still bodies everywhere, and they took pictures that no one had ever seen before. Nothing like this before, unless you're literally on the battlefield. Dead men where they lie. And this picture is really amazing. So imagine about a day and a half after the battle, there was a hot, hot autumn. You see them bloating in the sun. The bodies are bloating. Those are dead Union soldiers in Miller's cornfield. In fact, today if you go to the battlefield, this is right a road that goes uh, right through it. Uh, so you can stop right at the spot. They have, they have this really cool feature where you can see where some of these pictures were taken. Here are Confederate dead in front of the Dunker Church. And this became a sensation. No one had seen war like this. There were always you know, these dramatic pictures of warriors going to battle, which was always garbage. War was awful, beyond belief. And people saw this. And part of it was appalling. They couldn't believe they were sending their, their young people to go fight this. But at the same time, it became a sensation. Everyone had to see it. And so battles afterwards, photographers are going to be rushing right after to go get these gruesome photos. And by Gettysburg, they're moving bodies around to pose the bodies in more dramatic pictures. So it's pretty amazing. You go from, this shows the real hell of war, how terrible it really is, to let's make some money. We'll see the ones at Gettysburg a little bit later. I'll show you a couple more of the Brady photos. Actually, it's a photographer, Gardner is his name. Brady owned the studio. We never actually took a picture. And here's the sunken road. This is actually after the battle, but you get an idea of what it was like. You can see the corn. The corn kind of gradually down like this. So Union forces lined up to take marching down this way. There's just a few hundred Confederates in this sunken road, which is along this run right here, but it's a perfect trench line. And they came marching down, and they just, once again, cut down in their roads. Incredibly bloody fighting. That soon the sunken road became known as Bloody Lane. And that's part two of the battle. Bloody Lane. And this is a two very stylized picture of the Union attack towards Bloody Lane. And here are Confederates defending it. You know, obviously very stylized photos. But you get an idea of what it was like. And they marched down here. So these are two pictures I took. This is back looking at the Army built a tower. The Army always comes through. They still um, officers study this West Point as a whole class at Antietam. And this is actually looking back. So I'm standing right here with that picture looking from the tower down. So that tower's up. It's, it's pretty amazing, but let me tell you one story about this real quick. So I've been there a few times, and the second time I went there, it was a really hot July day. I mean, it was, wow, was it hot. This is the day that it was 110 on my car thermometer, and the humidity was 103. And my air conditioner had so much condensation that literally there was like a river under my rental car. I drive and all the condensation from the air condition. I thought my car was like leaking, everything, but it was just condensation. That was that's a fun day. That's good times. That was the day the low was 93. But I was up here and I'm walking, you know, hot, miserable day, and I went right down in here. So I walked down into there, and there's no one around, and just this miserable day. God, once I got into, into that, now it's kind of like four feet deep little depression now. Cover. I mean, thousands of these little black bugs. I got to just surround, cover me. My whole arm was black with these bugs. They're going in my mouth, my eyes, my ears. I'm like hitting them. They're just swarming like this all over me. They took me away. And I'm going to just don't. But they're taking my baby. No. But I went up and out of it, and boom, bugs gone. And so I did one of these experiments. I kind of went. And my arm got covered and I pulled it out again. It was the weirdest thing, just inside that trench. And so then when I was walking back this way, there's a man and woman had about three or four little kids, you know, like four to ten. And I said, you don't want to go in there. And they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And I walked to my car and I heard this screaming. And the kids are running around, ah, there. And I'll do it. So with that, now, after an hour of fighting on this line, near where this is right here, a Union Brigade finally broke through. And it was the Irish Brigade of Irish immigrants. In fact, if you look back over here, here is the Irish Brigade flag that I bought at Antietam. So, maps in the way. I'll move back here so we can see it. I love my Irish Brigade flag. 
So Irish immigrants, its commander would be one of the great heroes of Ireland. In fact, in 1848, he was part of the Irish rebellion that tried to free themselves from England. He'd invent the Irish flag. You know who it is? He's now, I mean, his, his likeness is on a statue in front of the United or Montana's capital. Thomas Francis Marr. Thomas Francis Marr, there's a painting of the Irish Brigade. That's the Irish Brigade one. That, that tower, like right here. And there's a picture of Marr. They invented the flag. He was condemned by the British. They commuted his sentence to life in exile in Tasmania. You know where Tasmania is? Yeah, the island south of Australia, south of New South Wales. He was sent there, escaped, made it to the United States, convinced thousands of Irishmen to, to volunteer, telling them that would help him for Irish independence. It didn't. But did he know that one? He thought it might. You know, the idea of fighting for freedom would do it. But isn't this word not about freedom yet? It's not union. Yeah, I know. Oh. He was telling them that, though. Oh. And he, he didn't recover very well from this. Pretty amazing battle. I'll just say this real quick. He would, uh, after Fredericksburg, and I'll tell you, I'll get to that in a sec, but after that, Lincoln would appoint him at first lieutenant, but he would take over as provisional governor of the new territory of Montana. He would go to Bannock, then Virginia City, and there's his statue, at, that's at Antietam. That's the other side of the Irish Brigade one, and there is a statue in, in front of our capital. Pretty cool picture, huh? Yeah. Oh, and that's the, the dedication of it 100 years ago. I love that with a flag over. That's just a great picture. He was he was almost certainly murdered by vigilantes on the Missouri River. The vigilantes were a bunch of pro-Confederate thugs, and it's amazing that we honor them with a parade here in Helena. And they're like horrible people. Yeah. Are you going to kind of ask some the motive? Or the vigilantes on the picture? They were killing political enemies and he was trying to put a stop to them. So they claimed he was drunk and fell off a riverboat. They certainly. So good little bit of Montana history. But what happened was they broke through. McClellan didn't send reinforcements. And those exhausted men were pushed back to this bloody lane and that battle kind of petered out right there. In fact, that's what Bloody Lane looked like after the battle. Those are the bodies piled into it. But this is the thing that always gets me. That's awful, right? Look at this. That's corn. Those are stalks of corn. Literally, all of it taken out except for just this bottom of the stalk taken out by shell, by bullets. That's how intense the fighting was. And that was thick of corn for acres. So McClellan was up here. He kept 30,000 men, a third of his army in reserve, and never committed them to the battle. Did you hear what I said? 30,000 men? If they would have attacked right here, they could have broke through after they broke through the bloody lane, got to Sharpsburg. Lee could not have survived. The war could have ended right there. And who knows? Who knows? It literally could have ended right there. Those men never left the hill. They watched the battle. He was so afraid that he was outnumbered, he never committed the reinforcements. So, while this is going on and dying down, an entire corps of 14,000 men over in, under Ambrose Burnside were trying to get across Antietam Creek. He could have crossed anywhere. Any of these two fords right here, Union soldiers could have crossed without getting their knees wet. But instead, he kept trying to go over this little stone bridge that's eight foot wide. Finally, the bridge now would take his name because of the efforts for over three hours, Burnside's Bridge, part three. Now, see the bridge? That's looking down. A few hundred men from Alabama held these hills up here and kept 14,000 men from taking them. One of those 14,000 men was my great, great, great grandfather. He's an Ohio regiment. I know what else you're thinking, but I want to see more of Burnside's Bridge. You can. If you look at that map up here, then look back at my Burnside's Bridge. This is an exact replica, almost inch for inch, of Burnside's Bridge, made of solid plastic. 
I bought this at the battlefield. I bought that map. I bought a book. I bought something else. I can't remember what it was. And these toys. So you can reenact the Battle of Antietam. See, it's a perfect model. And I have a whole bag. Yeah, yeah. So here's this model. You can have the Confederate. And a cannon. And I have no idea why the flight goes backwards, but it does. I'm still trying to figure that one out. And a guy on a horse. See? Aren't you impressed? And uh, don't I gotta play football. Don't use them. <laughs> and that's what we do all after the eight page so We just reenact the battle and keep it over. <laughs> <laughs> So I bought this. They did not price tags on. You know, I thought this is kind of funny to get, and this was like not cheap at all. And like one of those things, like I'm committed. I'm buying it. When I was there, the last time I had a bunch of guys from West Point there on the bridge. Is that how you worked on that? Hmm? Is that how you well, I didn't know. I knew they did it, but I'd never seen it before. It's actually the second time. We're at another battle called um, Monica, which is in Maryland. And there were ROTC guys there, reserve officer training. And they were coming through, and, and we're, my dad and I were walking through, and all these guys coming through in full pack, and, and they had their M4s, you know, my like M16s. And, and they're going, hey guys, <laughs> hey, how you doing? And they just all walk past us. So that's Burnside's Bridge. After over three hours, they finally took it by a concerted rush. Have you ever seen those stereoscopes where you put two pictures and you look through a little Viewfinders and it gives them kind of a 3D look. That's one side of those from 1863. So I just thought that was pretty cool. And that's taking Burnside's Bridge. And they swept behind Lee's line and they stole my plane. Lee was out of men. He'd been committed to the cornfield and the bloody lane. And they got behind and were sweeping this way in the late afternoon at that moment. Those last Confederate reinforcements from Harper's Ferry arrived. Literally exhausted, not having eaten, marched the whole time, got there, marched about 25 miles, and counterattacked the Union Army right there. The exhausted Union Army couldn't do it anymore. Stopped. If they wouldn't arrive, if they would have got over the bridge just a half hour earlier, the Union would have won a big victory. And once again, the war probably would have ended right there. We'd be talking about President McClellan's term starting in 1864. We still almost said that still almost happened, by the way. But at the end of the day, that's a picture taken of that spot right here. It's right about here, the day after the battle. And my great 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 grandfather's Ohio regiment's monument is right here along this road, right there. And I also have the one. I'll show you the one from Gettysburg. He was at Gettysburg too. It's kind of weird when you think about. You know, wow, he's he's all the way through Appomattox Courthouse. Made it. So with that, there's he's too English. And uh, this at the end of the day, both sides, they could not believe what just happened. No one had ever seen anything like this. This is one day and over twenty six thousand men were down in one day. About fourteen thousand of them were Confederates. The Confederates just had the counterattack, and the bloodshed was unheard of. There were bodies everywhere. And the thing was, at places like uh, over here where Bloody Lane was, there were just bodies piled up or in the cornfield. So not only was it so many men killed and wounded on top of each other, kind of mixed in, but they're all in these one spots and thousands of horses, too. So you can just imagine what that was like after the battle. In fact, both sides were shot. Of those casualties, over 3,000 died. This is the bloodiest day in American history to this day. And I want you to think about that for a second. This is still pre-high explosives. They're using gunpowder bayonets. That's how bloody this thing was. So other battles like at Sammy Hill in 1918 or uh, Pearl Harbor, D-Day, 1944. September 11, 2001 was close. Um, I thought it was. And so, with that, 
the bloodiest day. And the next day, both armies just stared at each other between like overlooking piles of corpses. And if McClellan, you remember, he still had 3,000 men and another almost 3,000 reinforcements arrived that night. And what did he do? Nothing. Nothing. I don't blame him in a way. They just couldn't get over what just happened there for one day. They want 12 hours, all that happening. But still, he could have ended it. He didn't. That, the night after, so on the night of the 18th, He was, and McClellan held the battlefield at the end of the battle, meaning he won, and it was enough of a victory to do what? Lincoln would issue soon afterwards. It wouldn't take effect till January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation. January 1st, 1863, it would take effect. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation Lincoln could not free the slaves, but he could he could carry out action to help the war effort. So to help the war effort, what he got to get is this. All slaves, all slaves in areas held by the rebellion, slaves in areas held by the rebellion are free. Slaves in areas held by the rebellion are free. Slaves in areas held by the rebellion are free on January 1st, 1863. Meaning, who was free? Who became free on January 1st, 1863? Nobody. Because the Confederacy was not going to free their slaves. They're only going to be free if what happens? What has to happen and then they'll be free? And the United States has got to win. If the U.S. doesn't win, they're not free. So it freed nobody and changed everything. Everything. A new country after this. Everything's different. This is like a moment, boom, everything's different. We are a totally different country. The legacy of slavery still exists to this day, but we are totally different. Yeah. When did this take? Uh, January 1st, 1869. So he's given the Confederates a couple months. Okay. And, uh, who cleaned the bodies from the battlefield? Was it just the town that assisted it? Or did you know, it was partially the town, the soldiers there. They had, they called them levies, a lot of them contrabands. Oh, right. Right. yeah. And, but here, it didn't free anybody, yet this great political document. And by the way, don't forget, war is politics, just can't. It's still politics. This is all politics. That's why so much of history is the history of Politics, you can't escape it. It's all politics. But this was a great document because it did three things. These three things you gotta get. Number one, it freed, it didn't free anybody, but it this way you gotta get. But it ended slavery. Why did it end slavery? Because it turned the war into a war for freedom. And once the war became a war for freedom, you can't go back. You can't simply tell people who fought for freedom and they say, ah, oh, we're kidding. Are we free everywhere except for like Kentucky? No. Slavery is done. Once they turn into a war for freedom, slavery can't survive. And the Confederacy knew it. Lincoln knew it. Number two, who can never enter into the war? What country? Once it became a war against slavery. Britain can't enter the war. What a great move. Now Britain can. Even though the government of Britain is like, hey, like to knock the United States down a measure, they can't. Even though the Confederacy would try again the next year. And number three, once you make the war for freedom, who can the United States start recruiting as soldiers? Yeah, black soldiers. Black soldiers will be recruited. Remember, they didn't accept black soldiers at first. Now, black soldiers. And soon, by the end of the war, one out of ten Union forces are going to be black. Even though the population of blacks in the North was pretty small, that means these are slaves when the war began, would volunteer and fight. And that would be decisive for the victory of the United States. The United States would not have won. Now, me the South said this is slave rebellion. Without them, now, a lot of them would be the, like you mentioned, laborers, they make them laborers. They would not let them in the, the fight. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But 
Here's Lincoln, and here he is with all the great documents of American history, of world history, as inspiration to write this glorious document. So they have the writings of Cicero, the Roman senator, and the Magna Carta, and all these things around him. And this idea that Lincoln is getting divine inspiration. But here's the Southern point of view towards this, and I love this one. Here's Lincoln writing the Emancipation Proclamation, and who's holding its inkwell? The ends of the And I love this one. That's a slave rebellion in the background. And who's his sainted figure? Notice the halo? A bearded man with a pike. Who? Did you say it, Mike? Say it again. Actually, to the south, he was like a Grim Reaper. But John Brown. And which to the south, that is like a Grim Reaper. Remember, John Brown. John Brown. But I like the Grim Reaper. And this would be huge. But here's the problem. You still got to win the war. And McClellan, for an entire month, sat on the Antietam battlefield. Didn't move. Lincoln actually went down there three weeks after the battle while they're burying bodies. And McClellan is saying, my army is too tired. You know, Lincoln's like, what have you done to get tired? In fact, that's where Lincoln would make his very famous quip. If you're not using your army, I'd like to borrow it. And then finally, after a month of Lee escaping into Virginia, you have to get this. Lincoln fired him. Well. Lincoln finally fired him. For good. They actually did it in the middle of the night because he was scared the army would rise up and revolt. That didn't happen. McClellan did go home, but it was still scary. And now here's the thing. He had to order somebody to take command. Nobody. He didn't know who to pick. Nobody seemed to be strong enough, but, you know, Burnside's bridge did fall, even though actually it was a terrible tactical move. The general was incompetent. But to Lincoln, he won. So he ordered, we're jumping right to Ambrose Burnside. He ordered Ambrose Burnside to take command. Now, remember, this was an era. Oh, and Burnside knew he didn't, knew he couldn't do it. Burns, I do. This is way too much for me. But he had no choice. Now, this was at a time where everyone would get pictures of generals and they would put them up. And you could imagine, you know, people would admire them or they would have like a crush on them. You know, they'd be, you know, they would swoon. And that's what I'm worried about, you guys. I'm going to show you a picture. Now, please control yourself. Out of either you're going to swoon, you're going to be so admiring of him, right? So here's Ambrose Burnside, and let's just just control yourself. Yeah. <laughs> now, there's some kind of feature on Burnside which made him so popular, and I, the buttons. I don't know what it is. Something about Burnside. And by the way, he would become so popular, and so, I mean so, I mean so, that people would try to emulate him by growing their own set of Burnsides. And that's where cypher, the term cypher comes from. Because you ever think about what cyberns make no sense, the word, what the cyberns even mean? No, that's actually somebody's name. And they reversed it. And one more thing. As luck would have it, we are going to do an extra petty press on that. We've already chosen one person who will be it. Who's the one person? John C. Calhoun. And then, <laughs> you must dress up on a map of Northern Virginia. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, and yes, it is so easy. It's so easy. Shave your head, and then glue, right? You're welcome. How many people have actually gone A lot of people have gone burnt, and you know, they'll put like a head thing on, but we've had a few people shave their head over the years. There are a number of teachers who I had in class who, one, the most of them, they all, I think they're all dressed up, but one actually shaved his head, one person who works here. You know, Mr. Rayot, he used to sit right back there. Yeah. And he looked, I think, so much better in this. Now, but I'm just saying. No, he shaved it and glued it and said it was the best decision he ever made. Maybe it wasn't the word best. I'm trying to remember. It was something like that. Maybe. I feel so stupid for doing this. It's the dumbest thing. <laughs> I mean, it was awesome. I'll give you one extra point, extra point. Two. And a hearty hand chop. 
So with that, here's Northern Virginia. Here's Washington. Sharpsburg's here. Here are the mountains. Richmond's right down here. Burnside is reinforced over 110,000 men. Lee has 60 to 70,000. And there's this big river right here called the Rappahannock. The Rappahannock River. And once again, you're welcome. Another perfect name for children. Do so you agree? You know, can you imagine that? Little Rappahannock, where's your sister Freeling Hoyson? And what about your both the back? And your dog Ticonderoga. So with that, so Rappahannock is a pretty wide river because it rains and rains. And Burnside knew he's put in command to attack. And even though it's winter, he's going to attack. And so here's what happens. Burnside decided, okay, big foresty area here called the wilderness. I'm going to get around that, go down river to Fredericksburg, cross here, and get behind. Not a bad plan. Middle of November, they got here. Lee was still here. It looked like it was going to work. The only problem is there's a river. There was a railroad bridge, but the Confederates had burned it down. They were going to get pontoon bridge. We're actually pontoon bridges. We're going to meet them there, but they were still in Washington D.C. So we waited and waited and waited three weeks. By the time the bridges arrived, who else arrived? And Lee was entrenched in hills while we're looking. Burnside though didn't know what else to do. I'm here, so they attacked the Battle of Fredericksburg. And the thing about Fredericksburg, this battle is going to have such an impact for the rest of the war. So they have to cross the river, and you see these boats? Those are pontoons. And they were using them to ferry soldiers across, but then you see how they're anchored down? You lay boards on them, and you have a floating bridge. That's a pontoon bridge. I'll tell you one more story about that a little bit later on. They, they, the city caught fire when they shelled it. There wasn't really fighting there. There is a drawing of them taking it. These are actually Union soldiers on the 12th of December waiting to go. That's them eating right there. That's a really good picture. That's a cool picture. It's cold. Can you imagine December? Virginia, so mid-30s, but it's cold all the time, humid, out. So you're out. They're out the whole time, they're outside. So they're just miserable. And on December 13th, 1862, Battle of Fredericksburg. And what happened was, there are hills called Marie's Heights, with like Mary's, but it's Marie's. The trenches are still there. If you go there, you can walk along the trenches. Some parts they don't let you, some parts you can go through. And here was nearly a mile of flat, no cover at all, just kind of flat plain going up. And then it goes up the hill. So the Confederates had guns all up here. See these little E's? Those represent camp. And Burnside looked at this and decided, I'm going to attack him right here. <laughs> and there was another one of those sunken roads with a stone fence. Can you think of a better defensive line? Still there. And they attacked here with a diversion down here. Nearly 60,000 men are going to charge up this hill. And they lined up in nice rows and went going up the hill. Oh, that's a good way to put it. They end up going three big wave attacks. If you look at this watercolor, that shows Confederate guns looking down. They couldn't miss. You fire, they could not miss. Shells would just bounce right through and cutting down them. When they got close, they turned to canister. And then when they got to within about 50 to 70 yards, depending on where they were, 10,000 Confederate guns all fired at once. Men were just cut down in rows and piles and heaps. Here they are charging up the hill. They said that the bulls were whizzing by and they felt like they were going, they were leaning down like they were going through a heavy rainstorm. <coughs> this is a map that this is the map they have at the battlefield. They, they even said you're here. They're gonna make copies of it. I have that map over there, same one. So they went charging up here. When they got to about 40, 50 yards, men just started hitting the ground, but there's no cover. What's their only cover? So they started hiding behind bodies. And there's stories of men saying that the whole day. And bullets hitting the bodies in front of them as they're just huddled down, some wounded, leading to death. And Burnside sent more waves. 
There's stories of wounded Union soldiers kind of reaching out to the legs of the men going by. They're trying to stop them. It's a slaughter. Don't do it. The closest they got to about 30 yards right here. They just couldn't get any closer. And they were just cut down. The third way, Burnside, even though everybody knew it wasn't going to work, he didn't, he didn't know what else to do. He was going to lead the charge on horseback. Now think about horseback. He'd be the biggest target in the battlefield. He didn't lack personal courage. Just intelligence of leading men. He just was all over his head. They pulled him down. They, they wouldn't let him go at staff. But they charged one more time. At the end of the day, it was a slaughter. The only place where Union soldiers broke through was a diversion. But since it was a diversion, it didn't matter. When night hit, over 18,000 men went down. But virtually all of them were what? Union soldiers. That night, men, you know, you hear, like, there's stories of men just crying in agony as it got below freezing. Could you imagine that night? And in the morning, Confederates actually did some, you know, both sides went out to kind of help the wounded man, but there was this very macabre side the next morning as hundreds, if not, you know, Union dead were out there. Maybe. Confederates went out bitterly cold. So, on that happy note, we should limbo!